flute maker, lined in tribal silence, speaks his fingers up and down. But it's dead, gone dead and dying. What was the feather-headed pennant, far sight, eagle eyes? What was the primary flower, flowering in the land, who danced until the rain came down among the arid stones and read the sand? Here before the first of us, to be the hated and the cursed of us, degraded, cheated, lied to by the worst of us, left to perish over wasted places, haunted eyes in tired, bewildered faces, accepting proofs and promises no one could understand. Countless pony hooves in pounded dust, gone in every puff of it, prairies, deserts, mountains, every valley, field and bluff of it, morning stillness blossomed, thistle in a blue sky cloud, home, land, grain and graze, and we couldn't grab enough of it. Gone, now almost all of it, gone into the final incantations, lingering to generate the annual celebrations. Old songs resung among the nightly crickets, silvered in a tampered moon on decontaminated fields and flowerless thickets. Nocturnal powwow, tribal costume, colours, dancing competition, Texans beaming all around us, no one had to pay admission. And this was all of it within the former ring of stones, among the drumming beads and feathers and the bones. A turning of the heads and eyes and shining skin, primal cunning of the spirits coming out and going in, a thunder of the drumming and the sad songs in the feet, multicoloured feathered fluttering, the humming and the heat. This was all of it, and only part of it, all of what was once the mighty heart of it, to be the end of what was once the primal start of it, camera crews and interviews trying to reach inside and catch the art of it. All the night went jingling with bells, silver stars and moonbeams on the rolling hills. Dreams of golden prairies, buffalo lush lands of a thousand miles, all remembered in the firelit afterwards. Cause of longing, tears and laughter. Cause of sorrows and of smiles. This land, the old man speaks. This mighty mother, Talks of peace and blooded brother, of times, ah yes, a time of times. Blue smoke curling up above the river pines. All the country out his mouth turns his eyes east, west, north and south and sweeps the wide horizon with his hand, recollecting where the vast ancestral eagle cast his passing shadow on the sand. When I am an old man, my loved one's gone ahead of me, I will keep a dog. I will not fear death then, as I do now, because it will be the shadow of my life, walking with me in the sunlight, beside me in my sleep at night. I will keep a dog, he must be sturdy and sensitive. I'll go on tottering knees and throw a stick for him, wheezing laughter through toothless gums. I hope I don't remember my youth, the mountain paths, the school track and the thin white tape breaking on my chest. I hope I don't remember the spring, the easy twist of muscle, the cold plunge and the prize, while throwing that stick for my last companion. I'll call him Junction, my last contact with life. It will be a sad time with all those happenings trying to call me to comfort through the alleys of my mind. It will be a sad time, bench-ridden in England. I know I'll die in England with Junction curled at my feet, and someone like Sir will make a funny picture out of us. Junction will be there when the time comes. He'll moan, and I'll know that I'm going, and I'll go alone. No one else but Junction and I will know. Perhaps he'll give my hand one wet and lingering lick before I smile and close my eyes and see the light. The children will run past an empty bench when the sun breaks. The goldfish will never miss my shadow on the water. Somewhere in the grass one might find a tooth-marked stick while they cross that field, smiling. It will be a happy time with children's voices in the park. If you see a sturdy dog beside a mountain stone or curl beneath an empty bench whimpering over an old stick, give him a bone.
wild bird be my soul tonight, and saw the skies for me, with the visions of the world around and the lights along the sea. Take my dreams on wind-wide wings, my heart within your breast, wash me in the seas of flight, and give my longing rest. I know there is some far-flown thing my soul has sometimes seen lay like silvered islands in the ocean's darkening green. I know there is a distant light and a bell sound on the foam and a fire beyond the frozen night to guide the spirit home. Listless giant observes her insides, sprawls between indifferent seas. She has no dreams, no quests to conquer, aspirations to achieve. Once a cosmic whisper started, within a decade rose to roars. She'd risen up and shot a rocket where none had ever been before. Spurred by one who barely started, downed in Dallas, flourished on, but who recalls the fledging eagle, or where these footprints first begun? Not those who beamed and took the credit, some who never dreamed of flight, some who never stuck their necks out to reach for stars across the night. Dreamless giant, introspective, gazes round with clouded eyes, yawns and draws the covers over visions of the virgin skies. It's neither insides nor the features. The mind's alive, but meaning lost. The muscles charged for any challenge, any climax, any cost. All she needs is worthwhile sagas, dreams to saddle, miles to ride, purpose for her spangled spirit, noble triumph for her pride. Talk to a brick wall is a premise for a play. There's one character. He is in a straight jacket. His legs are taped. He's in a totally white room. The character appears to be asleep. Yawns, opens his eyes, looks round, turns his head, begins to struggle violently, grunting and groaning and rolling about the floor. Stops, breathing heavily. Shouts. What about it? What? What about it? Pause. Quietly. Do what you like. Do whatever you like. You can't stop me. To himself. You might think you can, but you can't. Shouts. And don't think because you can't hear me, I'm silent. <laughs> Laughs. <laughs> and don't think because you're somewhere you can't see me or hear me that I'm not here, that I'm silent, because Pause. I'm not. To himself. <laughs> Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. What have I done? As we forgive them who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. That's a bloody laugh. Lead us not into temptation. In other words, it's there for us to be led into, not guided away from, led into. You're a rip-off. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. I really am sorry. I didn't mean it. Let's shake hands on it. If you just undo them a little, just enough to shake hands, all things being possible. Just a little. Go on. Don't be afraid. I won't hurt you. Promise. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. He pauses, thinking about the line. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever, beyond Ryle's boundary. Amen. Long gone, long ago gone, gone together long ago gone. Powder blue and the white sun shone and the earth burned away in the splinter of a thistle. We were a party of galaxy riders, adrift in our dreams at a penny a mile. One lost his ticket one night down a mine shaft, 
another departed for something worthwhile. We were consistent to Homeric values, trying to change shapes to keep up with the times, and selling our blood for the price of a bedroom, and most of our souls for nickels and dimes. We were radioactive, stereophonic, blowing our minds to the edge of the stars. We handled the cosmos like children with crayons, scrawling on pictures of Venus and Mars. We went to the gutters in search of our daydreams and scribbled our names into lavatory doors. One framed his existence in political prisons. Another one died far away in the wars. One learned to cure the sick and the dying, another to measure velocities of light. And one turned to words and remarked in a poem, how much slower one's watch seems to tick in the night. We met a business partner's date last Thursday evening. A lady more than physically complete. Tall and blonde, long limbs and very pretty. The sort you turn to look at on the street. The businessmen who sat around and ogled, smiled a lot and laughed and wet their lips and asked her things like had she ever modeled, in reply to which she sort of moved her hips. When they asked her where she came from ten times over, she admitted to Texas once, and then no more. And when someone tried to touch on love and marriage, she talked about the big low on the floor. Hubble asked her if she'd been to New York City. She said yes on one occasion long ago. When he asked her if she had enjoyed it, she whispered that she didn't really know. She'd been with a friend who hadn't any money, no hotel room or anywhere to go. It was Christmas and they'd spent the festive weekend in the back seat of his auto in the snow. Yes, she's been to New York City, Mr. Humble, and all around the universe and back. You may think she's sort of vague and rather easy. So are tigresses preceding an attack. I read the girl from Cincinnati from my folder. When I'd finished, there was silence for a while. Then she brushed a strand of hair from off her shoulder and tried to hide a tear behind a smile. Yes, she's been to New York City, Mr. Hubble, and all around the universe and back. You may think she's sort of vague and rather easy. So are tigresses preceding an attack. Once upon a time, in the land of Hushabai, around about the wondrous days of yore, they came across a sort of box bound up with chains and locked with locks, and labelled, Kindly do not touch, it's war. A decree was issued round about, all with a flourish and a shout, and a gaily coloured mascot tripping lightly on before. Don't fiddle with this deadly box, or break the chains, or pick the locks, and please, don't ever play about with war. Well, the children understood. Children happened to be good and were just as good around the time of yore. They didn't try to pick the locks or break into the deadly box and never tried to play about with war. Mummies didn't either, sisters, aunts, nor grannies neither, cause they were quiet and sweet and pretty in those wondrous days of yore. Well, very much the same as now and not the ones to blame somehow for opening up that deadly box of war. But someone did. Someone battered in the lid and spilled the insides out across the floor. A sort of bouncy, bumpy ball made up of flags and guns and all the tears and horror and the death that goes with war. It bounced right out and went bashing all about and bumping into everything in store. And what was sad 
and most unfair was that it didn't really seem to care much who it bumped, or why, or what, or for. It bumped the children mainly, and I'll tell you this quite plainly, it bumps them every day and more and more, and leaves them dead, and burned, and dying, thousands of them sick and crying. Of course, when it bumps, it's very, very sore. There is a way to stop the ball. It isn't very hard at all. All it takes is wisdom, and I'm absolutely sure we could get it back into the box and bind the chains and lock the locks. But no one seems to want to save the children anymore. Well, that's the way it all appears. Of course, it's been bouncing round for years and years, and in spite of all the wisdom whizzed since those wondrous days of yore and the time they came across the box bound up with chains and locked with locks and labelled kindly do not touch it's war earth fungus and the stuff of stars is what I'm made of I think and feel and love and hate the same I can't be used like slaves are or an animal or moved around like chessmen in a game Nation is conglomerate individual, divisible to the youngest moving part, multiple to human aspiration, generation of the spirit and the heart. So make your dreams as wide as your horizons, ideals as pure as justice and as true, and men will clamour to perfect what is your glory and willingly lay down their lives for you. Poet, dear poet, please write us a poem. Tell us of love and of life. Something quite simple. A smile or a dimple. A child and a man and his wife. Poet, dear poet, paint us a picture of colourful things and of love. Something of magic, nothing that's tragic. Sunshine and blue skies above. Poet, dear poet, dream up a vision of the glorious nature of man. Loving and giving, the defender of living, do it the best that you can. Poet, dear poet, give us a lyric of all we're aspiring to be, the godly and wise, and in spite of the lies, make it a mirror for me. A tinsel town hunter, alert in the nightlights, Cadillacs round with the world in his eyes, Reflecting an image of life on a billboard, riding a rocket up neon lit skies. Ape like maneuvers the chromium monster, laughing at things gone to seed in his soul. Love is the touch of a juvenile hooker, and God is alive in the Hollywood Bowl. Cruising the strip to fulfill his daydreams, shone in the flares of the mighty machine. Out of his mind, a fanfare of trumpets lets himself know that he's making the scene. Hands half his heart to the parking attendant, swaggers about in the evening crowd, affecting himself with an air of importance, a little too lavish and a little too loud. Erect at the bar, heckling the dancers, stripped to the skin with indifferent delight, applauds and takes note of the pubic gyrations to dream of a different vagina each night. Bred from a cinemascopic delusion of what the American male is about, his odyssey fizzles to silent disaster when the curtains have closed and the lights have gone out. The long abandoned fairground hangs in tatters, the empty stalls in dismal disrepair. The canvases and faded drapes and awnings limp and soggy in the saturated air. A blind man in a daily quest for contact taps his way between the empty pews. A barker sitting on a corner of a rostrum rereads an ancient copy of the news. It's no different now from yesterday, tomorrow. He sighs and slowly turns the mildewed page, his eyes long dim from poverty and sorrow, his face carved out of agony and age. 
Blind man feels a place and sets his cane down, removes his hat and lays it on a chair, hides his face to clean his tinted glasses, then wets his palms and flattens down his hair. A stripper at the gates stares down the highway, deserted asphalt going on for miles, overgrown with weeds and moss and lichen, excavates a memory and smiles. Once across the desert on a pullman, someone in the secrets of the dark occupied the vacant seat beside her, held her hand and made a flattering remark. Responding to his kisses and caresses, his hands upon her breasts between her thighs, remembered as a starlight through the window exploding in the oceans of his eyes. The pullman slowing to a standstill in the midnight, the desert silence in the volumes of the dark, man with neither name, address nor number, quietly slips away to disembark. So she lingers at the gates in contemplation, half a dream away from all the world, harbouring the spirit of a woman inside the tender body of a girl. Barker turns another page and grumbles. Topical events, he says aloud. As a contemporary member of the species, I can't confess to feeling very proud. Contaminated all the bloody planet, shot themselves to bits and blew the lot. Too damn dumb to get themselves together, far as I'm concerned, the human race can rot. Blind man takes his seat and sits in silence, never having very much to say. Barker tries to see behind the lenses, but blind man quickly senses, turns away. Your eyeballs look in pretty good condition. Barker peers intently from the stage. I suppose your brain could be compared to a canary with a pitch black blanket draped around its cage. Take my stripper now, an excellent example of what the human spirit is about. Hope, persistent hope and faith in something. She's trapped in open faith and can't get out. Stands there every day and waits for someone she met aboard a bus some time ago. Every time you ask her what he looks like, she'll tell you that she doesn't really know. Ever wonder what our great creator looks like, outside of a canary in a cage? It's impossible to describe the supernatural. Barker shakes his head and turns the page. Must look like a soldier to a soldier, statesman to them in Washington, D.C., poet to a poet, flower to a flower, but describing it's impossible to me. Electromagnetism through the all-engulfing darkness a continuum of galaxies in space, in finite time of motion, matter, measure. It's impossible to give it shape or face. Two eyes, she says, two eyes composed of starlight and sounds of blood like thunder in his veins, a thing of tender, touching love and feeling, but still without a face, without a name. Apparently he promised her he'd find her, and she believes in every word he said. That's why she hangs about around the gates there. For all she knows, the bugger could be dead. Blind man neither speaks nor moves a muscle. His glasses glimmer in the slowly fading light. Barker turns and calls off through the awnings. Come on, girl. We haven't got all night. Starts the generator, gets the lights up and the music. She dresses for the act in silks and lace, paints her nipples and regards them in the mirror, shades her eyes and puts a sequin on her face. Blind man claps his hands in agitation. Let's see some action then! He shouts above the noise. Stripper takes the stage behind the curtain, every inch alert, alive and poised. Barker draws the tab, she starts a number, piece by piece to pubic hair and skin. Beyond her from the darkened chairs and benches, blind man's lips curl upward in a grin. Bumps and grinds her pelvics, breasts and belly, shakes the apple structures of her ass sees herself reflected from the benches as twin images contained in tinted glass. And this is all the world, a broken fairground, a barker with a lot of things to say, a blind man trying to figure out the action, and a child to throw its innocence away. Tears, tears. She lies beneath his chest and cries. The night creeps by in instances of chokes and sobs. He moves and sighs, bends his face to kiss her eyes. Knowing why and knowing this tends to blow his mind to bits. How to mend a woman doesn't come in kits. The mind cries out and writhes and beats itself against the inexplicable like moth wings fluttering to penetrate the window pane. They know the ultimate in isolation, grip each other close and cling. Deprived of sight of one another's eyes, deprived of clarity, communication, the night secures their private wanderings. She turns in thought, looks back. 
Marwin, Marwin. A time ago, between them, she remembers now and then. The thrilling then to fill her womb with them. Her blood with love of them. Her life with love of them. Her life with love. But now the emptiness cannot be plumbed. There's no measure to the throat caught cry that screws the larynx voice box gullet in the windpipe wire tight. He strokes her breast, whispers she should close her eyes and rest. She laughs from sobs and tears. The cause is neither his nor hers. I've seen the world contained in ashes, harbored you, cradled for the journey through tomorrow, have already walked with you, sought you out among a galaxy of stars, risen over cosmic boundaries for your life, kissed your wounds, admired your scars, held you in the dead of night and at the point of death and in every loving second of delight. So hold me then, hold me, feel me everywhere, kiss me. Lay your tongue along me, on me, your eyes, senses. Put your arms around me, touch me then in all the close and secret places of me. Learn me, look at me, investigate, wet your lips and press them to me. Kiss me here, kiss me. Touch me here, encompass me. Smattered applause from the grandstand. The football rolls, the fog folds in along the river, round the garden walkways, down the coughing streets, arousing journeys huddled to and from the doorways, bare essentials, cigarettes, half a can of cat food, pennies worth of sweets. Well, there it is then, done. Say it's done, she says. The wish achieved sends impedimenta out, a clear-eyed, into what and where. He shakes his head. It doesn't matter. Life waits, tiger-hungry to consume us, and can't be measured either. Question, purpose, end result, and answer can't be. Nothing can. Only love. Yes, he says in silence. Yes, I know. Here he comes, old scramble brains, to shoot the juice of living through his veins, plunge in the event, dedicated and intent, dry-eyed power thrust on more and more, no one but himself to bust, in a flash between the dust to dust, doing like a long-gone sailor, locking with a horny whore. Take him, take him, it's hard to break him, thrust him up the inside of the meat stuff of the galaxy and shake him, or down into the bowels of the earth and bake him. Come up smiling in a bubble, bristling from ear to ear, and set for trouble. He's a cancer in the solar system. He'll clone himself and go on spreading when all the rest of everything's reduced to rubble. Old scramble brains, image and a likeness, so he says of God. A more astounding form of living never trod the earth before or dreamed so far, superseded its beginnings or set its ends beyond the vast horizons of the stars. Last angel. I came here to make you like a woman, break you for the calloused bitch you are. Came to suck your insides out and straddle you, and sparkle in your tinsel like a star. But your romance was a thing for reminiscing. Another thought electrified your brains, juiced you up to meet the coming cancer, and shot a lot of rubbish through your veins. You're a dying lady breathing out your toxics and taking in a daily dose of dreams. We'll have a rerun of your lifetime at the Roxy and project your soul across the silver screens. And the stars that pierced your canopy of magic will all attend the mourners round your bed to light the aspirations of the living and glitter in the darkness of the dead. When all the laughter dies in sorrow, and the tears have risen to a flood, when all the wars have found a cause in human wisdom and in blood, do you think they'll cry in sadness? Do you think the eyes will blink? Do you think they'll curse the madness? Do you even think they'll think? When all the great galactic systems sigh to a frozen halt in space, do you think there'll be some remnant beauty of the human race? 
Do you think there'll be a vestige, or a sniffle, or a cosmic tear? Do you think a greater thinking thing will give a damn that man was here? Actually, why don't you do this with a glass of gin and tonic? And it's sort of like the old white colonel talking, you know. We came up by Dal from Dar es Salaam with no intentions of settling down to stay. <laughs> it was an uneventful passage. The sails slapped monotonously in the wind, and we sat on deck and smashed our minds on hashish every day. Smuggling rhino horn to stimulate the oriental lovers, and a naked white girl drugged senseless in a canvas roll, wondering how she'd make out in the harem, more concerned about her body than we were about her virtues or her soul. The Arab trader prodded all her attributes, trying to beat us down to something less. But Jaime wasn't selling white girls at a bargain, especially as she and he were relatives and were doing it for a family in distress. The missionaries pursued us through the market, insisting that we spend some time with them. They'd suffered heavy losses in the Congo. Some priests had been castrated and dismembered, and the Reverend Mother had been raped by several men. But she'd battled back, and soon regained her spirits, and talked about the sufferings of Christ. Jaime thought she'd fetch a good price on the market. I prayed for loneliness and silence, and searched around to find a cube of ice. Sunset took us to the beaches, where we found a dead man wearing nothing but a municipal swimsuit and a smile, and stood round undecided if he was a tourist or another government official sent to study fish life in the Nile. Tetsi flies were out in force that summer. Sleeping sickness had gone rampant on the plains. There were far more carcasses about than there were vultures, and the drought killed off much of what was left before the coming of the long-awaited rains. Camera trips turned out to be a shambles, the tourists showing blatant signs of fear, jostling with the trackers and mingling with the tribesmen in spite of warnings that most of them were rife with syphilis and gonorrhea. And the man who lost his bomber over Munich had a three-dimensional postcard of the Queen, which the natives found to be quite stimulating as they broke into a frenzy and made signs toward our hostess, which were literally suggestive and pointedly obscene. And a big white hunter came from Cleveland for the season. His wife went on to see Victoria Falls, while he, in keeping with all white hunters, went off into the bush and killed a buffalo and an elephant in another futile bid to find his balls. Night sounds murmured through the shadows of the market. We found her, lashed beside a heavy-breasted black. She appeared to be a little angry when she saw us, so Jaime sold a speedboat to a fugitive from justice and borrowed some from me to buy her back.